Good morning, Rob, and welcome to the Local Paleo Show. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely, it's our pleasure. Good morning, Monsieur Marc. Comment ça va? En plein forme. Merci, Monsieur Alain. And for those of you who don't speak French, I'm doing good. <laughs> so, Rob, uh, thank you for coming on our show, and um, I hope you're safe and well where you are. And uh, could you tell us about your personal and professional background? Sure. Yeah, I've uh, become a film director as of late. I started in front of the camera a bit as actor, singer, musician, and eventually started becoming a bit frustrated with the state of things in the world, um, particularly around human health and planetary health. And I studied nutrition um, after I finished uh, college at, at New York University. I was living in Manhattan for the time. And then I moved out west to the west coast of the U.S., now living in Los Angeles. And um, I was learning particularly as I was studying nutrition, I was learning about this issue about our genetically modified food system. And here in... California, we were the first state in the United States to put GMO labeling on our ballot, right? Genetically modified organisms so that people would understand, uh, had the option to, to purchase um, whether they wanted to buy these genetically modified foods or if they wanted to opt out, which we thought was a pretty reasonable idea. And <clears throat> I was lucky to connect with uh, a small group of the initial instigators of that movement here in California and worked very diligently on that campaign. Unfortunately, we didn't pass the, the law to mandate GMO labeling here in California, but we did start a bit of a cascade a ripple effect of other states becoming aware in the U.S. And, and we eventually have kind of arrived at a bit of a, a higher level of awareness, I'm proud to say, where you now start to see, you know, U.S. companies actually labeling their products as GMO free or opting for the non-GMO project certified. So a lot of my activism really started in that community. And <clears throat> I was in my early 20s at the time. And I started uh, realizing that there was a lot of people frustrated in these movements and were pointing a lot of fingers at problems and not as much on the solutions. And so I started to write music about these ideas because I wanted to help the information get shared in a way that was less preachy and would cause less dissonance uh, among relationships because food and lifestyle can be a tricky thing to to talk about with you know friends and loved ones so i was noticing a lot of that in my own life um people that you know were looking at me especially at the time um, when gmos were just starting to get on people's awareness it sounds like the most insane conspiracy theory of all time that you know you have these big multinational corporations that are literally forcing dna from another species into our food system all the while monopolizing the industry and spraying you know our entire planet virtually with some of the most carcinogenic chemicals of all time sounds a bit sounds a bit wacky so i had to figure out new ways to get this information out there so i started doing some comedy sketches i started writing music about this and I noticed that uh, that was opening a lot of doors for me and people were really interested in that approach. And shortly after that, I connected with a filmmaker named Jeremy Seifert, who was doing a documentary on the subject called GMO OMG. And uh, I worked on that and I was <clears throat> also get getting my directing chops in scripted film, um, working on a, a buddy's script where I was, I was lucky to co-direct with him and started working uh, you know scripted indie romantic comedies and things like this and after uh, touching base with with my buddy who was working on the documentary it started to give me a bit of confidence to work on my own piece so uh, slowly but surely all these you know skill sets were kind of falling in front of me and my passion was really being fine-tuned where I knew I needed to focus on solutions <clears throat> and I knew I wanted to tell stories about the people who were already solving the problems. And so I connected with a filmmaker named Ryan Weirich 
about six years ago now, and we decided to make this movie called The Need to Grow, which initially started out as a documentary about urban agriculture solutions. Really, we, were, we thought we would be looking at things like rooftop farming and LEDs, aquaponics, hydroponics, or things of this nature to try to get young people excited about what was possible to how to grow food in a small space closer to cities. And as we started on this journey, mostly filming in, in the U.S., a, a bit in Canada, we uh, it quickly became clear to us how urgent this issue of soil health was and how by focusing on our soil health, we could actually mitigate and theoretically solve a lot of other issues in our environmental systems. So we can spend some time diving into some of those because it really addresses our water, our nutrient density, um, and, and maybe the most important is the ability to draw down carbon and store it back in our soils really where it belongs, uh, as well as you know, keeping pesticides and herbicides and chemicals out of our waterways, out of our human ecosystems. And uh, so we, we started filming and traveled around the U.S. looking at all these powerful solutions. And the film really became this hero's journey narrative of these three very different solution innovators. And yeah, so we've been on this, this journey of preaching about soil health ever since. And it's been an exciting time as I think the, the ideas of regenerative agriculture or carbon sequestration, and just focusing really on the foundations of our ecosystem has become a little bit more on people's radar. And the cool thing is it's inevitable because when you understand, you know, really how the foundations of ecosystems work and how much really does begin in our soil systems, uh, it's a powerful opportunity. It's more than hopeful. It really is doable. Uh, I guess the, the challenge is still the cultural and the political will. And that's why I think storytelling and you know, the conversation like we're having here today is part of that solution because the more people find out about the potential of soils to actually heal uh, so much of, of what we're struggling with today, um, it's really quite inspiring and I think can invite people into the conversation rather than shaming them about something that they do or don't do, but, but actually showcase some really accessible solutions. So that's kind of what my work has been all about is trying to bring people to that next step whatever that is, wherever they are on, on their journey of environmentalism or eco-consciousness, however they want to think about it, you know, what is that next step for you? Let's get you there and keep moving forward. So uh, that's a bit of it in a nutshell. Yeah, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> what kind of reception did you get on your movie in general? Yeah, so... You know, coming from a background of scripted filmmaking, um, and I spent many years looking at, you know, the psychology of communication. Because I had kind of hit, as I mentioned, this sort of dissonance in my own life where I was trying to explain ideas to people that I cared about, and I was finding really strong resistance. And I realized that so much of it has to do with the way that the message is presented some often so often it's not about the message itself but actually the messenger and how that what that relationship is between you know audience um and the whether it's the you know speaker or just person who's sharing that that knowledge and so when i stepped away from doing a lot of that in my own personal life um to kind of I guess let people off the hook a little bit about some of the things that they were participating in. Um, I realized, you know, how do I do this in a way that the people don't put, build walls up immediately. And so what we saw was what I saw earlier in my career was, you know, through comedy and music, our documentary is certainly not comedic by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but what we realized was that storytelling was so important to that. And, you know, the brain actually works in interesting ways. You know, you can hammer it with fact after fact after fact. And it actually doesn't quite register in the same way that a descriptive story would. And even if the story were false, you know, or embellished with details, say, you know, in a fictional narrative, um, the brain actually has a different way of storing this information. 
And you will remember more about a story, particularly if it has a human or could be an animal that is somehow personified, right? Where you relate and see yourself in that story. Um, you actually remember this and recall it way more, you know, scientifically. So than just hearing fact after fact, uh, particularly if it's coming from a shame perspective. So with us, we were really lucky to stumble upon these beautiful uh, characters, these heroes that were all on their own hero's journey. And we didn't know what the story was going to be initially. As I said, we had kind of different ideas. And when we found these amazing people that were working on solutions around the country, um, the story kind of wrote itself for us. And so what happened was we ended up following them for years in the midst of some really interesting challenges, struggles, seemingly some defeats, but ultimately kind of the phoenix rising from the ashes. And so we ended up having, you know, something very similar to a, a three-act narrative that you might see in a, in a scripted documentary because we just, you know, we stayed, we were patient and we followed these stories for as long as it took. And I think that has been the key to the reception of the film is that people are able to actually identify with these, with these people that they're watching on screen. Not necessarily that they would do the solutions exactly as they see them, but that they can see a bit of themselves in there. They can see resilience, they can see perseverance, and um, they can see the challenge that we're all facing. And so the response has been profound. You know, in our first week of releasing the movie, it was screened in 175 countries around the world. And we were kind of blown away by how many people have written in and saying, you know, this is giving me hope for the first time in a long time. And I've been inspired to either restart my garden or start planting something for the very first time ever. Uh, you know, a big part of our message is to try to grow some percent of your own food, but it doesn't even have to be food. If the first thing for you is just, you know, growing your first plants, or maybe it is an herb indoor or whatever it is, you know, that first step to get the, get the ball rolling and, uh, the number of people that have said, you know, I, I realized how important composting was, you know, turning our food waste back into healthy new soil and why that's a huge part of the solution. So, you know, it's it's just been really, uh, you know, beautiful for us and rewarding. The biggest reward has always been when we hear people say that they've they've adopted a new, you know, lifestyle or they've changed something even if it's now i'm going to go to my farmer's market for the first time or i'm buying organic for the first time whatever that may be you know all of those things just mean the world to us because we know that you know we're part of the ripple effect it doesn't have to be one solution and it doesn't have to be one film that solves the entire thing but we've been i think on the right side of history here talking about soils at a at a time when um, it will become a bigger and bigger deal particularly as folks you know make that connection with carbon sequestration as our plants photosynthesize and draw down atmospheric carbon dioxide and actually can pump through carbohydrates, those sugars through their root systems. And the importance there is the microbial life in the soils. So we've kind of opened people's eyes to this beautiful, you know, galactic world that is happening right under our feet, these trillions of microorganisms that actually are the foundation of all life on earth. So we get a little bit nerdy in the film, but through some cool animations and and some great music and um but ultimately it's a human human driven story and i think that's why it resonates so much with people sounds great um so again what is the title of the movie the film is called the need to grow and need it's to grow. Uh, narrated by an actress and activist named rosario dawson okay. and she does a beautiful job and uh yeah it's it's available now on, on vimeo and in the U.S. on Amazon, but we periodically do some worldwide free screening events, so you can look for that. All right. Well, um, for the record, I'm, I'm going to request a, a free viewing. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, so uh, I would like to take a look at it for sure. I, I know about, oh, my God, uh, GMO, oh, my God, and I also wrote a whole book on anti-GMO myself, so I'm familiar with the issue. Um, yeah, um, we can always so, do a, a very nice um, review for you as well, if you want. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, 
Let's see. So you say we can find it on uh, Vimeo and Amazon, right? Yeah, U.S. only for Amazon. We kind of okay. did a, 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 a different distribution model, and um, that was part of, I think, how we reached so many people initially was through a lot of our partners in environmentalism that stepped up to the plate and helped us share it around the world totally for free. <clears throat> so we actually just just did another big free screening a few weeks ago. So yeah, good, good. So what is uh, you have a website as well? Yeah, just the need to grow dot com. Yep, and Sounds also social media is at the need to grow Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Mm -hmm. So being in California, what has been your experience with the COVID nineteen situation? Well. Um, I live in a major city, so it's been it's been interesting. Um, yeah, it was what what initiated my wanting to escape to Montana just just the other day. Just spent ten days out there, beautiful Glacier National Park, and um, yeah, we've been. You know, it's it's like many places around the world. It's confusing and uh, I think disempowering in a lot of ways and just making do with, with the best that we can. You know, my personal um, interest has been trying to make sure that my friends and loved ones are still getting outside as much as, as much as they should and mm -hmm. not feeling, you know, so isolated from nature um, because we know how important it is to <clears throat> get outside and breathe fresh air. You know, our indoor air is incredibly more polluted than our outdoor air, um, except for maybe the circumstances of extreme fires, which we have had here in California as of late. Mm -hmm. But um, in general, you know, getting outside, breathing fresh air, getting exercise, and, and most importantly, it's probably getting sun exposure, healthy sun exposure, and getting some vitamin D. So yeah. uh, for me, it's been, you know, how do I manage this isolation while trying to maintain my health protocols and I, I'm an avid trail runner so I, I'm lucky to get out there. In the very beginning they closed the trails which was kind of frustrating um, yeah. to say the least but uh, you know it's all about finding those, those spaces where you can do that and, and find some peace but you know it's, I hope it's been a wake-up call for people to be more engaged with their own health and take responsibility for their own health uh, for many people, unfortunately, it hasn't been that. It's been even more kind of handing over um, the their responsibility to outside influences. But I think this is going to be an opportunity for people to, you know, realize that nothing else really matters if we don't have human health, right? I'm not a personal That's sense. Right. Um, that yeah. is the most valuable thing for you as an individual and then now we're seeing as a society, it's actually the most important thing. And so in the U.S., you know, we have probably the most unhealthy first world nation, right? We certainly have the most obese. We certainly take the most pharmaceuticals of any country in the world. And yet yeah. we are the sickest. <clears throat> so um, I'm hoping that this will be an interesting opportunity for folks to kind of look at that in a new way, things that people don't really often take the time to observe and what our medical system is really focused on and, and how much it avoids treating the real causes of illness. And um, this, this might be a time where we can evolve as people and if the education is there and if it's done in the right way. And I think right now it's been really divisive um i i don't know i mean I, I know it is around the world and here in the u.s we're kind of reaching a, a climax unfortunately leading up to um some pivotal political things coming up and um you know we've just had this cultural division that has been really toxic and i i you know i pray i wish and i'm constantly hoping to find ways that we can you know, reject the idea of vilifying people that are different or think differently than us. And, you know, maintaining this open-mindedness, particularly at a time when 
people are so scared and they're so frightened that, you know, they're more susceptible to hang on to their tribes, right? And they're more, they're, they're more likely to, to cast out anyone who thinks something slightly different. So, you know, on the topic of, of the coronavirus, there are a lot of different approaches. Um, and ultimately, I think it comes back to focusing on the foundations of human health that we've known for thousands of years and returning to these ideas of what have been unfortunately classified as alternative medicine, even though conventional medicine is the alternative. You know, we've been doing things that, that actually, uh, you know, build human health, the foundations of health. And my other company um, is actually called Integrative Pediatrics. And I'm not a doctor, but my, my good friend is a pediatrician here in Los Angeles. And so we talk about you know, we, we try to help through the lens of, of parents, mostly moms, to be honest, of how they can look at um, their children's health. Because I think there's a different impetus to focus on the foundations when you have, you know, your child. And through that, we have this secondary um, benefit of the parents actually learning more about their own health, right? We teach them how to apply these uh, foundations to their kids, but then they're thinking, wow, you know, I have to live by example. And so I think that's a, that's an important opportunity as well. And so we talk about the seeds of health, S E E D S, which is stress, um, the environment and toxins that you're exposed to exercise, diet, and sleep. So we dive into all of these things, um, in depth in some of the work that we do there to try to educate parents on how, you know, we should be turning to those seeds of health, those foundations of health, before we go to the toxic pharmaceutical, before we go to the, the bigger intervention. And I know that that, I wouldn't say the tide has turned, but the movement is growing um, around this type of thinking because, you know, it, it becomes inevitable as people get sicker and sicker and sicker and as generations are you know, living shorter lives than, than we were before. So eventually you, you hit this wall where, you know, we can't just get more and more obese, more and more ill without looking at our food system and without looking at these other foundational factors, particularly stress. Um, right. so, so yeah, these, we, moms, these moms are lucky to have you. Um, so, uh, uh, just on a side note, uh, here in Austin, the city tried to shut down the parks and the trails, and uh, within minutes, all those were taken down, and people kept on walking and running and all that. So, Good. you know, you know, as Texans, we're rebellious kind. So, yeah, um, I, I would be lying if I said I didn't uh, sneak under a few <coughs> closed trail signs and and just go for a run anyway. Yeah, well, hopefully Governor Newsom is not going to hear you. Um, <laughs> so going back from, um, so from your nutritional background, what would be your suggestion as to how to support your immune system? Right. Um, you know, the big questions, right? These, my, I think, for me, it ultimately comes down to this concept of bioindividuality, really, of working with uh, a, a practitioner, hopefully, who understands the concept of bioindividuality and isn't just trying to um, kind of impose systems that they have seen in themselves or in others. <clears throat> I think it's good to have, you know, that feedback of what has worked for other people. But ultimately, you know, we have to have these metrics to be able to determine if these things are working for that individual, right? I truly believe, you know, some one person's medicine is, is another person's uh, poison, I guess, for lack of a better word, but, but what can cause, you know, detriment, right? So certain things, even, even uh, you know, what are considered health foods or superfoods can sometimes be irritating people, even things like probiotics, you know, for some people are amazing and for other people can actually, you know, exacerbate an issue that they may be dealing with. So, you know, I think so much of the knowledge that we already have about things like sleep and stress are overlooked. You know, we actually have studies that show that when people are sleeping properly, they're less susceptible 
to respiratory infectious disease, for example. That's not the only thing we're worrying about with our immune system, but right now it's quite topical. Um, we know for a fact that stress actually lowers our response to these types of things. We know, we know for sure that things like vitamin D, which is truly a, a hormone and you know, participates in so many uh, processes in the body, that these things returning to natural systems would actually help balance our immune system. So it's, you know, it's where do you start with, with, with an individual and what is the advice? Again, I'm not a, a medical professional, so this is all just, you know, my own personal opinion, but um, every person is going to be different, right? Are they lethargic? Are they depressed? Are they not connected to community or friends? Are they not going outside? Are they just eating junk food? For many people, it's a combination of a lot of these things. And so it's where do you start on that wheel of making small changes to get people to see, wow, this is doable and, and enjoyable. You know, if I can remove some of the nasty foods, I think in many ways is more important than, than eating certain foods, right? It's actually more important about what you don't eat, in my opinion because of so much processed chemicals that are, you know, invading our, our bodies. And then ultimately, we have this microbiome, this beautiful microbiome in our, uh, in our gut mostly, but also on our skin, in our mouth, our nose, everywhere on our body, essentially, that is somewhere between 70 to 80% of our immune system. And, you know, how do we balance that? So again, uh, just like in our soil film, and it truly is a beautiful analogy. You know, the, the soil of the earth is really the, the microbiome of the earth. And the gut in ourselves is kind of like the soil in our own human ecosystem. And on both sides of that, on a micro and macro, we have destroyed these diverse ecosystems of these beneficial microbes. And we're kind of reaching this point culturally of, you know, uh, sterilizing everything and sanitizing. And it's very easy to overlook these invisible heroes. And they really are, you know, there are some villains, right? There are some viruses, some bacteria that we don't want to be around. But ultimately, there is an invisible uh, cosmic level ecosystem that's happening all around us all the time, whether it's under our soil or whether it's inside of our own bodies. And these microbes, you know, in a, in a tablespoon of soil, you could have 10,000 different species of microbes. And what's going on there? You know, there's, there's just mind-boggling levels of intricacies and complexities that even the top soil scientists will admit. I mean, we, we might know 1% of what's actually happening in soil, believe it or not. And there's so much more to learn. We literally know more about the stars in our, in our sky. Um, than we do about the soil under our feet. And similarly, we're just starting uh, to understand, you know, through some, some human genome project work and, and through, I guess, this new interest in, in probiotics and the gut microbiome. Um, it's become a bit trendy, and unfortunately, you know, some companies are hopping on the bandwagon, as always happens. But I think we're at the beginning of learning you know, how critical this microbiome is to our overall health. So if you can work with somebody who understands that um, and is helping you to not just take a probiotic, right? We have to escape this kind of pill popping culture. And so many of the COVID strategies, I think, are still in that mindset of, you know, what's the simplest thing we can do um, without changing our lifestyles, right? How far can we go, even with the world shutting down, um, and people losing their jobs and losing their livelihoods, even that for some people is, is not enough to help them to question the foundations of their own lifestyle to take their own health into consideration. So I'm not sure what it's going to take for most people, but hopefully um, what I do think is it's not going to be done by shaming them. And it's not going to be done by making them feel bad about the choices that they've made, but that it's going to be done by inspiring them um, through you know, the beauty and the joy of, of what living a healthier lifestyle means and the security that you get when you have your immune system and the confidence that you can have of existing in the world and feeling 
that uh, you're not as susceptible as you could have been. And there are simple strategies and then there are, you know, more long-term ones. But uh, hopefully the people will start to just think about, you know, wow, well, like in the U.S., I don't know <laughs> what it's like for you guys, but for what has it been, seven or eight months, and uh, virtually no advice has been given by any health authority about how to actually increase your health, how to actually boost the chances of you having a positive outcome if you are exposed to a virus like COVID-19. And that, to me, is like the twilight zone. We are living in um, a very strange dystopia where the health authorities are not even willing to recommend health. And, and many people understand why that is. And unfortunately, it has a lot to do with, with money and control and paradigms. And even folks that aren't necessarily corrupt who have just been uh, bred into a certain dogma of belief. And so these systems need to be dismantled and we need to be open-minded to the people that are out there actually talking about things like nutrition, and people that are talking about, um, you know, stress protocols and things like that, because you won't hear it from the top down um, as we've seen, right? It's the most, it's historically the wildest health crisis we've seen in our lifetimes and you still don't hear a return to advice on actually building human resilience. So that to me is very alarming. And that, is, is, that should scare people, um, that you haven't seen the, the simplest of advice. And why is that? And you can look into many years, even before this, this issue, um, where some of our you know, health agencies have really been looking out for the very companies that, that profit off of this more than more than the people themselves. You know, in the U.S., virtually every every major environmental or health agency has, for a long time, been prioritizing the well-being of the corporations that they're supposed to be protecting us from. But it has been the exact opposite. You know, instead of looking out for the people, and keeping them in check, they look out for the well-being. Of these corporations so that has a lot to do with funding politics lobbying and uh until we break that off i don't know if it's gonna change when well you know, it's it's pretty about. well it's pretty well known that uh the heads of the fda and the cdc are in cahoots with the pharmaceutical industry and and uh and they switch, you know, they either work for the government and support the pharmaceutical industry. And as soon as they get out of the government, they go back to work for the same company. You know, like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, <clears throat> the head of the FDA w used to work for Monsanto, right? Yeah, Michael Taylor, who was the food and safety czar, appointed by Obama, actually, um, was the former was a former vice president of Monsanto. And he had gone back and forth, I believe, more than once. So that was a huge disappointment when he appointed him. And I think it's telling of just how this, the stranglehold that the structure has on the system. And um, you know, it, it may not be, right, that, that everyone is evil or in on something or in some back room you know, devising plans against everybody, but it's just the fabric of capitalism's grip on how laws and how decisions are made. And they know for sure. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry um, certainly has a, has a gr huge grip on both sides of the political parties here in the U.S. And um, as you mentioned, yeah, the FDA has, has been certainly infiltrated um, by yeah, the very and, industries and, that it's <clears throat> And that's right. just one. Uh, the heads of the C CDC, which is a private company, by the way, is also highly connected to pharmaceutical industry. And my uh, personal opinion is that they are, tr they are dragging their feet and delaying everything until a vaccine comes in so they can benefit from it. Um, I'm talking about Dr. Fauci and, and so on, Briggs and so on.
It would, and, it would certainly line up with many other strategies that they've done over the decades. And, uh, you know, particularly in the last 40 years in the U.S., the pharmaceutical industry has you know, really taken over. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the, uh, many people understand things like the oil industry having, you know, this, this, this big control over our politicians and how much we've delayed, you know, s switching from fossil fuels to different sorts of, of strategies there. But uh, a lot of folks don't realize that the pharmaceutical industry is m a much bigger lobby, lobbying industry than oil even. Yes, uh, yes. By far, uh, they've been the biggest funder of politicians for many many years and right right, you we, should, uh, why, right? we should look at some politicians bank, uh, bank accounts and there's also um, again you know some people might think it's crazy but i'm sure you heard about it as all of these uh, suspicious suicides of alternative medicine proponents in the past few years have you noticed i i have heard some of this, to be honest, I haven't looked into it deeply, um, but it's, you know, for me, when I started to dive down the rabbit hole of some of these things, <clears throat> you know, I, I realized that um, there's not much that's too crazy anymore. It doesn't mean that every crazy conspiracy theory is true. And so yeah. you do have to still have a, a discernment there um, because right. otherwise, you know, you're up for grabs to whatever the wildest uh, rumor may be, but, but with that said, I've I've learned, you know, very clearly that uh, they will go to great lengths to protect. You know, these are these are multi-billion-dollar industries, and right. uh, yeah. So it, I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but I don't know enough about it. Right, right. Um, you know. Let's not forget the influence of the the mainstream media in pounding fear into us and pounding uh, all of these. Um, once you start digging into research and scientific paper, all these lies that they spread and to keep people in fear and in under control. Also, keep in mind that a lot of a lot a very few people like us are standing up against that. But a lot of people are completely um, mind controlled by these uh, mainstream messages. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people, I mean, <laughs> just uh, this morning I saw PepsiCo um, quarter report and uh, their snack business has gone through the roof because people stay home, they stay in front of the TV, they watch these news, they get scared, and they stay confined by their own choice when it's really not that bad out there. So, you know, we're talking about people getting sicker because they keep on stuffing their face with, um, you know, fast food and, and garbage processed food. And, and the, mental, uh, the mental effect of these, you know, watching the news constantly is, you know, uh, it's gotta be devastating for a lot of people. Can you address the mental and emotional issues uh, related to that situation as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was a big reason why for the past 10 days, I finally got myself to unplug from all social media, Instagram, Facebook, and took a break and didn't watch any news. And, uh, you know, the whether it's through the mainstream media or even through social media, you know, has kind of become infiltrated by these algorithms and censoring and things like this, where they're helping to direct whatever narrative is suits them best. And really that's ultimately to keep people on devices as long as possible, whether that's their phone or whether that's the TV. And I don't think in many ways that the industries themselves um, are really I don't think their priority necessarily is to drive fear from them. What they've realized is that that is the best method to get people to watch longer or to stay on something longer. And so there's, you know, very real psychology about 
uh, how much fear will keep you listening or alert, right? I mean, we obviously evolved that if someone's just telling you a nice story about their kid, you know, having a fun soccer game, you know, you may, you're going to probably be less uh, in tune to, hey, there's, you know, this big dangerous thing that's coming into town, right? It's, wait, what? You know, tell me about that. So, you know, we, we know for a fact that if you say, you know, oh, coming up at 10, you know, there's the murderous whatever thing that's, you know, plaguing the streets, um, whether that's people or a virus or, you know, it doesn't, it could be a storm, you know, whatever it may be, that the longer that you can keep them hooked on, you need to hear this thing later coming up because if you don't, you're in danger, right? So we know for a fact that danger and fear will actually keep people in their seats because we've evolved to want to protect ourselves. And so when you start to recognize that these industries on the news, you know, also are funded, uh, at least one third of their commercials are pharmaceuticals, then those, that's really who they're working for, right? They're selling those ads. So how does a business structure work? Well, if I can get you to watch more ads, I make more money as a network. Right. And so I think it's often lost on people that the news is a show like any other show. Right. It is entertainment in some sense. And it is a business, most importantly. And so they have to they are like all businesses, you know, incentivized to try to build profits as much as possible. And so if you do testing on psychology and you realize, you know, wow, fear actually will keep people watching longer. Therefore we make more money on our ads. We can charge more and you know, our business does better. So looking at it from a business standpoint, um, it becomes very clear why they would want to continually perpetuate fear narratives. And you know, the social media thing has, like I said, has, has become unfortunately uh, less free for lack of a better word over the, over this past year. And it's similar, you know, now they know that young people particularly are just scrolling endlessly. And how do I get them to watch more ads? How do we get them to see more ads? And so we curate, we hack their brain. And there's a great documentary that just came out on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, which I highly recommend. And, um, you know, we'll give you an insight as to how much psychology has actually gone into the, into the creation of, of our social media, because, Things like Facebook have become where a lot of people turn for their news now. And, you know, that is just obviously, or it's obvious to some of us, has become just an echo chamber of, you know, the things that will validate your belief system. So also, so as much as fear works really well, well, validation and confirming your bias also works really well. Um, it's a nice reward system to show you, hey, everyone else thinks just like you. You're right. Those other people are wrong. Um, and so, you know, we have this curated, individualized, you know, feed on our Instagram or our Facebook. And again, it's really from their point of view to sell ads. And, you know, it's, it's capitalism at the core um, of, of most of this corruption. So. I think people need to understand that and hopefully try to break free and think, how can I support the things that I want to see more of, right? As important as voting is, well, we vote every day with the things that we purchase. You know, you literally vote three times a day. If you eat three times a day, what do you want to see more of in the world? And that can be hard for some people with financial, um, you know, challenges, but how do you move in the direction and figure out ways that we can actually send, you know, we literally are voting with our dollars, right? You are investing in a company. If you buy from Coca-Cola, you are investing in plastic pollution. You are putting money into the biggest plastic polluter on the planet of plastic bottles. And, you know, if you buy from a farm that is degenerating our soils, and yet you are really passionate about environmental solutions, well, then there's an opportunity here to make that connection, that I can actually, you know, send my dollar, send my investment, and send my vote for something 
um, through my purchases that will actually regenerate ecosystems and or regenerate my own health. And so, you know, it's breaking out of advertising. Like you say, we see Pepsi's stock go up, Amazon goes up, Facebook goes up, right? All of these creature comforts. And I think a lot of people are psychologically okay with, you know, being grounded right now. There's this kind of collective what I feel is sort of this collective shame of what we've done to the planet and to ourselves. And many people are so socially anxious already that to be quarantined or to be grounded, I think there's a subconscious level of people thinking that they deserve it and that, that we are supposed to be like that we failed somehow. Yeah, but that is that is being implanted by, you know, uh, by some people on high. This whole guilt about uh, global warming and the green projects, and you know, so on and so forth. So, uh, personally, I do not believe, and it will not influence me on my on my decisions. Um, I'm doing my part to pay attention. You know, I, I do support and I eat, uh, you know, healthy farm products and so on and so forth. I drive a hybrid car, you know, I pay attention, uh, you know, I spend my, my water, my electricity and so on. Um, but if people feel that way, they should probably remember that a lot of that guilt is being pressed upon us by the higher, higher up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it keeps you able to be influenced by the next ad or the next, yeah. you know, you know, parent figure that tells you what to do. Because if you feel so disempowered and uh, guilt ridden that you messed it up or you're participating in something wrong, well, then you're more likely to listen to, you know, whatever the, the big solution or the answer that they tell you to do, fall in line, follow this, you know, it's, it's like every sci-fi writer um, through history has kind of predicted this would happen to humanity. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, it's a herd mentality. You know, again, for me, I like to try to bring it back to the psychology. I think that when, if enough people were to understand, you know, the psychology of communication, the psychology of beliefs, and how these things happen in our brain, um, you start to become a little bit more aware of it. And, you know, you can read a book uh, called Propaganda, written by one of the greatest uh, propaganda influencers in history. And he actually lays out a lot of the, the strategies and how they hijack psychology and they hijack, um, you know, authority and they hijack these these dogmas and these uh, structures of society to kind of perpetuate fear, perpetuate beliefs, and sometimes through really clever subconscious indirect means. Um, but it's, you know, we'd be naive to think that, that some, you know, these big companies with billions of dollars at stake or these big governments or whoever is really hanging on to their power, that they don't have people on their team who understand how, propaganda and psychology works you know they they do they have these people it's part of their strategy um whether they use it for good or bad right propaganda doesn't necessarily mean negative you can actually use propaganda for good but you know how are you working within the human psychology framework to hit certain trigger points that we know historically get results and it almost works, it's eerie how uh, controllable people are, uh, particularly when there's herd mentality. And that's because we're social creatures, right? We evolved to go along with the pack because if you think about the evolution of humanity, you know, to, to think differently to a point where people are so turned off by your uh, viewpoint they would cast you out into the cave and you'd live there alone and you would die right and so in our very dna it's programmed in well you know your lineage is going to die off if you don't comply with the group you li it's literally your survival you know you can't survive 
alone. Maybe you would live one lifetime, but ultimately humans are social creatures and we, we do depend on each other. And so this like great evolutionary, what once was I think a benefit of, you know, figuring out, wow, I, okay, I, I should stick with the tribe, stick with the herd and I will survive, um, has now become probably our greatest challenge in that we're unable in, in many cases to even consider ideas that our friends and loved ones don't deem acceptable. And, you know, when we vilify people who think something differently, we have to recognize that they're participating in just their tribe, right? What was the conditioning? What was the culture? What were the traditions? What were the beliefs that were handed to them? And I think people are inherently good when given the opportunity, but more so we have this this psychological programming to fit in. Um, you know, no one wants to get up on stage in front of a group full of people and just be booed and have tomatoes thrown at them. It's a pretty terrifying fear. Everybody wants to get up and have everyone cheer for them, right? I mean, how good does that feel? So if I can say the things that my echo chamber are going to reverberate with positive and say, yeah, that's what I believe too, right? I mean, it's really hard to break out of that. It takes a severe amount of courage and uh, self-awareness and uh, patience and you know something that I still challenge with uh, that I'm I'm still struggling with myself to this day uh, I think I'm um, down my side Mark do you have questions for oh, Rob yes 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 Firstly, Rob, I mean, you've, you've obviously got a very um, thoughtful and um, interesting understanding of, you know, human history and what we're going through at the moment. So congratulations on that one. Um, you actually said something that I found very apt and very amusing. Um, there's not much that's too crazy nowadays. And uh, I think that's getting truer and truer as we, as we go through these weird times. Um, Coming back to your film, The Need to Grow, um, obviously that's based on um, you know, the real need that we have to get back to food that's got a decent level of nutrition. Do you personally get the opportunity to grow your own food and eat your own food? Well, you I've been lucky to uh, have a lot of friends that they grow more than I do. And I'm still learning, I'll be the first to admit, you know, as, as we were traveling um, around the country and learning all of these urban agriculture methods, you know, I was able to bring in as many as I can in my limited space here in a city, you know, I'm in a one bedroom apartment. So I unfortunately don't have my own yard yet working on that and cannot wait to actually uh, apply more of these strategies. But as far as what I'm capable of doing, I, I really try to max out um, take out, you know, those excuses. And so the balcony that I have has, has as much as I am allowed to fit. I used to have a larger tower garden that I snuck up onto our roof, which unfortunately the city of LA told me was not allowed. And I was forced to remove that. Um, I did kind of ninja plant in the shared space of my apartment, uh, as many herbs and veggies as I could, which are still doing well that I don't think anyone realizes that I planted. And, um, and then I've got my indoor system. So because I am in an apartment, you know, it's, it's not the perfect solution, but it's the perfect solution for my situation, which is to have some indoor grow systems that are working um, with lights. And hmm. then I also, maybe most importantly, I think I'm doing indoor composting. And so making sure that my food scraps are not, ending up in a landfill. You know, it's one thing that, that people don't realize how much, uh, you know, 40% of our food is wasted and it's probably higher than that. But the food waste, once it goes to a landfill is actually rotting. And, you know, how can we actually turn that problem into new soil? And so the food scraps that have all these precious nutrients and all that energy that was gone into growing that food in the first place, if you can compost it, you know, now you're keeping those nutrients back in a cycle instead of just extract, 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 which is what our 
farming system is mostly based off of. We actually want to return that and think again, you know, in closed loop systems and cyclical. And, you know, when I can put that nutrition back into my soils, um, now you've got something special. And the reason why it is special is because the microbes are alive Mm -hmm. and that's going to be better for you, better for your plants. So yeah, I'm doing, doing my best. I also, like I said, I am lucky to know, um, some of the best farmers because we were looking for people who are who actually understand soil health and as 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 we always say you know it's uh you're not really focusing on feeding the plant if you focus on feeding the soil the plant being healthy with a healthy plant immune system is mm-hmm. an inevitable byproduct so you really want to think of yourself as a soil manager and if you can manage soil health plants do their thing they know how to grow right and so i know a lot of farmers uh one of which is is a bit of a drive away from me but whenever i'm able to get down to his place he's he's in our film his name is eric cutter this farm is called allegria fresh and uh, i'm still convinced it's the most nutrient dense food i've ever eaten and we've seen some of that in, in some of our testing but when you taste produce grown as fresh as possible uh it's a game changer. And so that's why I think growing food, particularly for young kids, you know, if, if they're not interested in a tomato or a cucumber, when they grow their own food, they certainly will be. If they participate in it, you know, there's a huge transformation that happens there. Yes, indeed. indeed. So when, when you're out visiting the farms, did you go all over the States? When we first started the film, yeah, we actually were, initially we wanted it to uh, focus on urban agriculture and so we were visiting as many major cities as we could so you know new york boston portland seattle san fran you know we were bouncing around um and so we we didn't really get as much time as you might expect from a a, a food film or an agriculture film out on large scale uh farms Mm. and that was partly intentional at first because it wasn't our it wasn't our mission when we were trying to make the story. And then over time, you know, the, as the story kind of was writing itself, as these things were happening with people, um, as you'll see in the film, there, there's kind of some unexpected twists and turns in their personal journeys. And what we, you know, arrived at was we, we felt that we had a movie that really showcased what, what people could do at all levels um, mm. so there wasn't just large scale agriculture of which other people have done great films on that. So we, we just took a different approach. So, so yeah, most of our, most of our, the people that we know, we've some, yeah, we've got, we've got friends now, luckily in, in many cities. Mm. So when we go to visit, we can get some, some awesome food. Excellent. So, I mean, initially then you concentrated on sort of how somebody could grow food in an urban environment rather than an agricultural yeah, so we we do try to touch on on all of those scales in the film um, through these three very different kind of superheroes, as we like to think of them, and what 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 missions that they have. And one of them is is an eight year old girl, you know, who's just starting community gardens and school gardens and seed libraries in her, her own community. So that is definitely part of it. And I think for most people who watch the film who aren't large-scale farmers um, you know that is a big part of the takeaway is how do we use these solutions that exist already whether it's an indoor light system or whether it's an outdoor you know tower garden that I could do on a rooftop patio a, you know a balcony uh, that's the kind of stuff that we want people to take away hopefully to say yeah, I mean I can do that like I, I don't need to commit to something massive right it's that can be a bit daunting but I could get one of these little towers and put some potting soil in there and start growing some of my own food and i think it's that hook um you know once people start getting their hands in the soil once they start seeing life in that process once they really care for their first plant or start their first garden then something changes where it's okay i want to keep doing this or I've grown some food and I'm so excited about it, right? I'm going to share this with my friends. I mean, you know, to make like a a meal out of something that you grew, it's going to mean so much more. And it's very real. Like that will actually, you know, metabolize and digest in your body in a different way because uh, you will be in a different 
state of mind and it's fresher for one, you know, our food starts to lose its antioxidant potency the moment that it's picked. And so even foods like organic foods that we see in the supermarket, which are free of pesticides and fungicides and all that, that's great. But how long, you know, has that food been sitting there? How long did it ship across the country? How far? And, and um, you know, we show in the film, there's a cool scene where he picks this lettuce and you see what we call like this lettuce milk. It's a really concentrated, you can kind of think of it as an immune system of, of this lettuce. And it's some of the most anti-cancer, you know, antioxidant rich compounds that are in the plant. And, and that stuff is gone within 24 to 48 hours after picking. And so most people have never seen it in their life and they're like, what? And then when you, uh, you know, when we hear this a lot now that we've made the film, when people start to grow their own lettuce and they get that, lettuce milk for the first time, you know, everybody sends us a, a picture like, Hey, you know, it's real, it's happening. And, uh, that these are these, you know, powerful compounds that unfortunately we start to lose and so much of our food is picked before it's ripe. So again, you know, so many benefits of, of trying to get it as fresh as possible. And if you don't grow your own, the farmer's market, if you're lucky enough to have one near you is a great alternative, uh, because, usually that food has been picked within either that day or the day before. Excellent. I mean, you, you actually set me up for a good joke there. How do you milk a lettuce? Say it again. How, how do you milk a lettuce? Answers on a postcard, please. Right. You, you mentioned earlier that you, you've got your own um, you know, light system and you had a tower system at home. Um, have you gone through sort of a, a series of those to find the one you like the best or just did you sort of get the one you like straight off? Uh, I think I did a, a lot of research on them beforehand and some systems have, you know, have different pros and cons. Um, you know, I'd be happy to, to mention the ones that I have if, if, yeah, if you'd yeah. like. So, um, you know, a lot of companies have, have kind of hopped on the bandwagon and, and done sort of indoor light, systems uh the one that i've found i think the simplest for people and so part of it was was re was me really putting myself i think in the shoes of of folks who aren't into this and who want something accessible and easy and simple and so one of those solutions that i found is a company called click and grow which is quite affordable and they make sort of a soil like media you know, hydroponics is a system where you're just putting nutrients through the water itself. And aquaponics is a system where the fish are actually fertilizing the plants. And really, you know, there's, they can't really replace soil. Ultimately, in my opinion, it will never quite match the way that nature intended. But these are good supplements to uh, maybe feeding cities and doing it in small space. And, and they also can actually take some of the pressure off of our soil system. So I think that they're all part of the solution and it's not so absolute. So this company Click and Grow is doing, a, you know, it's an automated light that's above your plants. You literally pop in pods that have seeds pre-built and you plug it in and you walk away. I mean, it couldn't be easier. Um, and then as far as the towers, you know, there's a lot of great, a lot of great towers out there. Mr. Stacky makes a nice tower system in a small space. Green Stock is another great company. Um, one that I really like is called Garden Tower Project because it's a it's a system that actually has a composting centerpiece. So your garden is a cylinder and you can spin it and it fits, I think, 40 or 50 plants in just a very small space. But the what's so cool is in the center of it is actually a perforated composting tube where you can put your food scraps and actually as the compost nutrients um, are made available, they'll actually be cycled back into your garden automatically. So that's quite cool. Um, there's a company called SubPod that makes a, a similar thing that you put in a garden itself where you compost and you bury this little container. So those are a few. Um, I don't work for any of them, but I like, I like all of them. Excellent. And you haven't got into wormeries and things like that at all yet? Into worms? Wormeries, yeah. You know, you yeah. Yeah. So my, so yeah, exactly that. Um, well, that garden tower project, 
would be optimized by by doing vermiculture right or worm composting and my indoor system <laughs> believe it or not yes is uh is vermicompost in, in fact that's really the only way you could do it indoors um and so yeah i've got i've got my red wigglers my little worms and uh i just left them for a while so i was quite concerned and i came back and they're all thriving and there once you get that going you know the the system that i have it slides right under my kitchen table i mean you would never know it's there right so people would come over you know it may weird people out that there's worms there and i'll admit it was a little strange even for me are they going to crawl out what's going to happen but you know they stay in their in their system and you know, I put food scraps in there and depending on what the food is, if it's something thinner like a lettuce or if I chop it finely, uh, you know, it's gone in almost a day. I mean, you, you return to that a day later and search for the remnants and it's virtually gone in a few days, almost anything you put in there. And so that's really quite cool, particularly as you learn about the science of, of soils and how precious they are and how much they're depleting around the planet you know the un had estimated that we only had 60 years of farmable soil left on our planet because of the rate that we deplete our topsoils so we're destroying soils about 10 times faster than they can regenerate but in nature at least but what we actually are able to regenerate soils quite quickly mm -hmm. through things like composting and regenerative agriculture so yeah when you transform that now you've got even more incentive to expand your garden or because, because you've got this soil and what are you going to do with it? So uh, th those two habits, I think, you know, feed into one another. Yeah. Yeah. And on the sort of the, you know, the largest scale farms, have you worked at all with the Saver Institute? I haven't worked with them personally, but very well aware of their work and mm -hmm. uh, admire of, of some of the work that they've done. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, know about them. We've, in, we've interviewed um, Chris Kirsten a few times, and he's very much on the same page as you. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, working with farmers to um, you know help them grow good good grass, good soil. Exactly. Yep. Um, so you know, you've made this this first film, the need to grow. Um, is there a second one in the offing? Yeah. So we've we've got a few things in the pipeline now um kind of developing a potential series for tv we'll see how that goes uh it's a long arduous process and if you know it's living in hollywood and most of my friends are directors and actors i know how 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 challenging that can be especially for an environmental project but um we we've got some things in development and then our next feature film will actually be focused on a topic I was touching on a bit earlier about our, our microbiome, but particularly uh, how it is associated with what we call the gut-brain axis. And so our, our inside of our gut system, actually, you know, we make so much of our neurotransmitters, you know, many of our feel-good hormones, like our serotonin, as much as maybe 90%, and dopamine, things like this, are actually produced inside of our our gut and so we have this connection through what's known as the vagus nerve and this gut brain axis we're actually seeing scientifically that the health of our gut ecosystem actually can determine a lot about um, not just cognitive things like alzheimer's dementia etc but also just our mental wellness like anxiety and depression and with slight changes and it seems almost science fiction because how are these microbes really controlling that but when you understand the body as a whole ecosystem, right, it's not these separated, oh, you know, just that organ independently and that organ. And, you know, in conventional medicine, we have these specialists. And I think we get kind of caught up in that idea that the body is almost like a machine of these parts. Um, and to an extent it is, but ultimately, you know, there's, there is an ecosystem, right? There's communication. We're even learning that our heart has a microbiome. And there's actually a heart-brain axis. And so the, as much as our brain is sending messages to the rest of our body, um, our gut has as many neurotransmitters um, as, you know, the brain of probably like a golden retriever, you know, a, a decent-sized dog's brain. We have 
uh, this much happening in our gut. It literally is our second brain. And so I find that interesting how, you know, historically we've had this idea of, of going with your gut or trust your gut, right? Even before the science was showing that we literally have what is quite, quite scientifically could be classified as the, 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 you know, the makings of a brain. I mean, literally, um, you know, we've kind of known this all along, right? And, you know, feeling with your heart and trusting your gut, you know, I really do think of these things as three different brains, you know, our instinct, right, our emotional center, and then sort of our logical thinking mind. And it may sound woo-woo to people, but what's so exciting is that through, you know, you know the, the genetic science that we've been doing over the past 10 years or so, um, it's really being proven that, that these things that somehow we've known in culture about trusting your gut or gut instinct are actually really based in physiology and biology. Uh, so that's really exciting to us. And, and even more than just mental health, you know, we're starting to learn about the other associations that are happening inside of our gut. So I think it's a really powerful opportunity because when you associate the depletion of our gut microbiome, that inner ecosystem, you know, we see all of these diseases happening, but you can actually associate, there's correlations being made now between even things like certain cancers with certain strains of bacteria. And uh, it's a whole new frontier. And I think offers a lot of possible intervention that will help people heal when they <laughs> understand this. And, and we've seen, you know, there are studies that in 30 days you can transform people's mental health with, uh, with just focusing on the, the bacteria in their body, as strange as that sounds. No, not strange at all. No. So with, with all the sort of the work that you've been doing, uh, obviously over the last few years, um, and the influence that it's having on sort of different sectors of society. What what type of world would you hope that that's going to create in say ten years time? Yeah, ten years. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, you know, sometimes people ask, you know, if you have hope, right? And I've kind of arrived at this thing about hope is kind of irrelevant, right? It's just about what is the next step need to do? You know, what is the action that needs to be taken and, and educating ourselves? And um, there are solutions out there. And so, you know, having hope, is it going to work out or not, is, is almost irrelevant to me. It's, you know, what can I do to actually help push that along? And mm -hmm. I, do, I do think you have to accept that, you know, the world is not on any individual's shoulders. And sometimes when we learn about these overwhelming things, we want so desperately to participate in changing things and you know we we can only do so much and so that that's an important component to mental health actually but for me i do believe that the transition is going to actually accelerate over the next several years um it's not going to be necessarily graceful um, is probably what I, these are just predictions, right? They're, they're just my guess at this point that the, the regenerative or the healing future will come as a result of people being desperate for it. Um, you know, that these comforts that we've talked about have been hijacked into our psychology to keep us complacent and keep us participating kind of enslaved in a certain system and you know the crap has to hit the fan where uh it has to be on your doorstep i think for people unfortunately and you know people are seeing these fires here in california and they're you know it's just it's these wake-up calls that are happening or disease that you know finally strikes someone that that they know or you know a lot of times for people when they get really sick is when they change their diet finally, right? They realize, wow, what have I been doing? Um, and it's only at that level of desperation. And I think on a human species scale, it will have to probably get even a bit darker before it becomes brighter. Um, that may sound pessimistic, but um, I think it, it actually is is optimistic in that 
you know, humans, when they see the, the, the writing on the wall, when it's like, wow, okay, we've destroyed this much biodiversity, we cannot survive as a species anymore. Um, we have to do something. And it sucks that it takes that, you know, that we are still moving towards the cliff's edge. And there will be some things that may be irreversible, right? Some things that have been set into motion. And so I think we need to just continue changing. Um, we're not going to go back to really anything the way that it was, nor should we want to, right? We're always growing. Uh, it's part of the reason why we named our film The Need to Grow. It was not just about food. It was about humans, you know, the need to grow up on these issues and the need to grow as individuals. And um, I think that, you know, these ideas of regenerating our soil, the ideas of localizing food and uh, the resilience of systems, you know, in nature, biodiversity is everything. Right. The Amazon is a great example. You know, an invasive species is not going to take over because of how much biodiversity, whereas you look at a monocropped farm and then they're susceptible. And so when we have a lack of diversity in our soils, in our plant species, in our animals, but also in our own gut and also in our own thinking, right, in our people, um, whether that's culturally, skin color, sexuality, gender, whatever it may be, that Diversity is actually the way that a system thrives. I mean, we can see that again and again and again. And so <clears throat> with diversity comes the idea of decentralizing, right? Localizing things is diversity. It's maybe not what people think of as diversity, but, you know, centralized systems where most of our food is grown in the Central Valley in the U.S. and in uh, California, and you're getting so much from one system, well, that's now susceptible, right? That's at risk. What if something happens there? But if we have local systems, just like local businesses, as opposed to, you know, everyone buying everything from a company like Amazon or everyone hearing from, a, from one news source or everyone reading one book or listening to one speaker or watching one show, whatever it may be, that diversity is ultimately um, what will be embraced, I believe, and it will become cooler, it will become sexier, hipper to actually invest in your local community. And I think when we can get people to do that, um, to really truly feel good and celebrate those things, not just do it as a responsibility or a burden, but actually to say, you know, this feels good, not I'm being punished to support my local business, but actually having that awareness that there is a local economy, um, thinking locally, how do I affect the laws and the, you know, the, the jurisdictions and the, you know, the bills and the, the rules that are happening in the, in the local parks and communities and school systems. You know, you can make headway locally much easier and faster because you can usually get in contact with people much easier. And um, I've seen that personally in my own in my own life with just working on things like chemicals that are being applied here in Los Angeles. And um, I, I really do think that's the opportunity. And it needs that constant reminder for people because so often, you know, in the States, we have a presidential election every four years and suddenly everyone cares about politics again. But it's like, what is happening in those four years in between? And am I actually concerned with my local officials? Who are we electing here who will really change things on a city or state level? Um, and I hope that that becomes more interesting to folks and uh, we kind of reclaim that power and get engaged, right? We so often think, you know, someone else will, will take care of it and we forget that I forget what the saying is or whose quote that is, right? I kept waiting for someone to, to do something about it. And then I realized I am someone, right? I can do it. And um, I think that will, I think in the next 10 years, we will see more of that. You know, from, from, from my experience right now, I'm seeing so many folks in my generation who are returning to these, you know, back to the land kind of ideas that was once sort of an, an hippie, culture right of returning trying to do like what they might call conscious or eco villages or things of this nature 
And I think it's a different opportunity now because just by the sheer nature of the internet existing and accessibility to things, um, that there may be, I hope, more success in actually making those things sustainable. But uh, so many people that I know <laughs> that live in cities um, or live in urban areas are thinking, you know, we got to, we, we, we we're rethinking where we want to be and what kind of lifestyle we actually want. And I think more of that will continue to happen. I think people will start to, you know, think these things go in waves, right? Like the breath, you know, people will, will leave cities and then over time it will, it will become cool probably to come back after it's been, there's less concentration of population. So I think these things will oscillate like that, but uh, I hope we're entering into a phase where, where we slow down and we unplug and we reconnect to nature. And uh, that, yeah, that has to be inevitable because it's either that or the species basically doesn't exist anymore. So um, I think, I think it will inevitably happen, right? We will have to focus on solutions. Mother nature will impose them if we don't do it on our own. Yes, indeed, indeed. Good words. Now, you, you mentioned earlier that um, forty percent or more of our food is actually wasted. That's obviously part of the equation. What ways can you see that can be used um, more efficiently to decrease the amount of food that's wasted? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so much of it starts, I think, with just uh, preserving and storing things differently. That's probably step one. But there are easy solutions on how to bag things, on how to, you know, many things that people ha just haven't been bothered with figuring out, right? How to reduce spoilage and things like this. Um, it's interesting, when I was up in Montana, the, the glass jars were actually selling out people couldn't find them these jars that people would can you know uh in previous generations you would actually you know store your your canned goods through the winter and people are returning to this type of thinking now and you know whether that's out of fear of the food system or just realizing how fragile the food system is i think it's an important an important strategy that we need to return to and so when I think of that food waste, you know, it's easy for people to imagine a giant mound of food and 40% of it is taken and thrown into a landfill. But we also need to imagine that 40% of the water that was used to grow that food, 40% of the human labor, 40% of the carbon that was, you know, as to drive it across the country and 40% of the pesticides that were unnecessarily sprayed that make our way, make their way into our rivers and streams and down into our oceans, right? All of that um, for, garbage so there has to be a, a paradigm shift in the vanity of foods you know certain countries are starting to uh change their laws around you know what's known as like ugly produce and offering that for less uh expensive prices there's a company here in the u.s called imperfect produce that actually started by taking the the blemished or crooked you know you know whatever strange thing that we think of as strange only because we've been brainwashed into imagining these few variety in an exact, you know, ideal shape and size. Um, when you grow your own food, you're certainly not thinking that you're not going, Oh, this squash came out strange, like throw it out. Right. You know, you're still going to enjoy the nourishment just as much. And, um, you know, celebrating the uniqueness of that. And so I think we, we will break out of those paradigms. You know, uh, supermarkets throw out so much because of the legality and the, you know, not wanting to have the liability of selling someone a, you know, a rotting bag of spinach and, and they are held accountable. So having some of those uh, rules that, change for opportunity for supermarkets to at least donate that food is a big part of it. The, the gentleman who made that, that film GMO OMG, we talked about, he was also a consulting producer on the need to grow our movie. His very first film was called dive. And it was where he spent probably about a month just dumpster diving. And as gross as that sounds to people, what he found and what you would see in that film was 
you know, the most untouched, perfect foods just being put into a dumpster, totally wrapped, totally safe, totally sanitary for most of it, where you could find entire loaves of bread, entire, you know, bags of peaches, entire things of meat, you know, and, mm. and he lived off of it for, for a while. And there are people who do. Um, mm. Not something that I'm particularly recommending because, of course, there are inherent risks in doing that. What we need to do is get that stuff to not be put into those dumpsters yeah. in the first place. So changing that paradigm is a really challenging one because I hope that there's a way to tweak it where supermarkets can see it from a financial uh, you know, viewpoint. If there's a way to help them to not waste so much food, like that's factored into their, their budget already that a certain percent of it is definitely being thrown out. It's definitely not being sold. And that's got to be, you know, we need people on those teams specifically to reduce food waste. And there's a lot of great initiatives out there, right? Finding just research your area and food waste and see if there's somebody that you can support or learn more about and how you can not, not necessarily just financially support, but just hear about what they're doing and help spread the word about those opportunities. Uh, Cause we have to head in that direction. It's uh, you know, there's a, there's a great book called project drawdown um, by an organization and a gentleman by the name of Paul Hawken, who was the editor of a book called drawdown where they were looking at, you know, all the biggest opportunities for where we could reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and food waste was the number three on that list. And the only reason it wasn't number one was because they couldn't quantify the methane and nitrous oxide that is emitted from landfills from our food waste, which is actually immeasurable because there's just so much being sent to landfills. And the way that it decomposes in landfills is not the process that you want. It's not going to turn it back into soil and compost. It's actually going to emit all of these greenhouse gases. And so uh, food waste would be the number one opportunity for solution according to their data if you were to include the uh, landfill emissions. So it's a massive opportunity for a shift and I think is, is really overlooked. Yeah, especially when you think about it. I mean, 40% isn't that far away from half. So if yeah, nearly half people, of all the food produced is wasted, yeah, many. There, I, I have seen newer projections that put it somewhere actually around fifty-three percent. So, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it is if it is more than half, and that's just it's a shame. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, you've given us a lot of information, um, very thoughtful and uh, knowledgeable information. Where can our viewers find out more about what you do? Your website, or social media, and that type of thing. Yeah, so on any of the social media, just at the need to grow. So uh, that's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then our website is just theneedtogrow.com. So it's all the need to grow. Our company, you know, our film production company was called Earth Conscious Films. And it kind of evolved into what is now called Earth Conscious Life, which is our larger platform. So we have uh, a pretty big newsletter now where we communicate with people all over the world and they can sign up to join that community and you can sign up at earthconsciouslife.org or just the need to grow .com. Um, it'll it'll point you there as well and um, you know we we like to offer people a lot of these accessible solution opportunities and try to educate people on what they can do in these small steps to move us into the right direction and really thinking about human health and planet health as the same conversation, right? So taking these people who care about nutrition and, and, uh, and human wellness and you know, making that absolutely clear that these things are so intertwined that the same things that are good for our bodies are good for our planetary body and vice versa. And so I think when we get the environmentalists also to really care about their own personal health and human health, you know, then we have really a recipe for success because it's not, it's not one or the other. It's not my selfish self-interest um, and it's not just taking care of everybody else. It's, uh, they're the same. 
And I hope that we can really just offer those solutions for people on all scales, no matter where they're at. And as I always say, you know, not about telling people what's wrong, but trying our best to, if we do mention something wrong, focus on an alternative, right? Mm -hmm. How can we shift the narrative towards, towards the solutions, I think is just so critical. Excellent. Now you mentioned earlier that the need to grow is available on, is it Vimeo? And, um, oh yeah, so you can watch, yeah, you can watch the film on Vimeo. Here's my little, oh, let's see if it stays in my, uh, yeah, this, so this is our DVD, The Need to Grow. We have DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, stuff for sale on the need to grow com, and from our website you can also find how to watch it digitally online, and that would be through our platform Vimeo. Um, in the U.S. you can get it on Amazon, but uh, not internationally yet, and then we'll be unrolling a few more platforms in the coming months, probably things like iTunes, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, Vimeo works works great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Now, we've asked you a lot of questions. Is there anything we should have asked you but didn't? Oh boy. Let's see, we covered a lot. <clears throat> um, I think the main thing that, that I like to leave people with is just this awareness of soil being at the foundation and what I'll return to what I sort of started with a bit of, you know, when we, when we change the microbial life in our soils by a mere 1%, we're actually able to store about 25,000 acres of water per acre. So that means we're reducing drought and reducing flood just by microbial life in our soils. When the life in our soils is there, the nutrients are made accessible for the plants. You have actually the way that nature intended, you know, even in the last 40 years or so, we've dropped some of the nutrient and mineral levels in our foods dramatically, in some cases 70% or more in certain foods. So we're eating foods that look like the shape of what they once were, but are not really containing the, the nutritional density that our, even our grandparents had, right? So that is huge for changing human health. And when we reduce the spraying of pesticides and toxic fungicides and herbicides, which we would do to protect the life in the soil, because these things kill those microbes, we're actually now preventing all of that, that pollution into our environments. We're protecting farmers who now we're seeing pop up in the tens of thousands saying, you know, I believe my cancer is caused by the chemicals that I was exposed to. Mm. Uh, these nitrogen fertilizers, these synthetic fertilizers that we're using are only because we haven't cultivated the life in the soil. When the life in the soil is there, you don't need these extensive inputs, of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And most of them, people don't realize, come from the fossil fuel industry. They're synthetic fertilizers that come from fracking. And so again, you know, when you build the life in the soil, you've now reduced the need for these nitrogen fertilizers, half of which, about 50%, don't even stay in the soil. They wash off, they go down the rivers and they cause these dramatic blooms that algae blooms that kill off and create these dead zones in the oceans. So we're talking about saving our oceans. We're talking about human nutrition. We're talking about saving farmers, we're talking about um, the water actually holding and sponging when it rains and preventing drought um, and less fire uh, prone actually as well. And then you know, pulling down the atmospheric carbon back into our soils where it actually enriches the soil. So the soil is just checking the boxes on issue after issue, as well as creating the opportunity for biodiversity to thrive, right? In these major landscapes that we've just destroyed the grasses, destroyed the biodiversity, destroyed the insects, killed off the birds, the gophers, the, you know, what you name it. And we want to just create this productivity of these monocrop genetically modified foods. And that system of extraction and pumping full is like, you know, taking steroids after steroids after steroids, eventually it collapses. You cannot sustain that. And so when we hear this term of unsustainability, you know, we have to really let that resonate that if it's not sustainable, it actually does have an expiration date, right? It's not just, oh, it's not good for the planet. It's, it will end. You cannot do it forever, right? So we have to inevitably create these, 
these new strategies. And going beyond sustainability, since we're already in such a dire state, is this idea of regeneration. And this is a beautiful new future that we have as an opportunity because nature regenerates quick when you give her the opportunity, when you back mm -hmm. off and you give her the things that she actually wants, just like the human body. You know, when you really take out the things that are causing you stress and, and stress on your body and the foods, you know, the, the body is resilient. Nature is resilient. They actually want to heal. You know, the human body wants to get better, wants to heal. It's designed to. Similarly, similarly nature does as well. And so I think that's why our soils is is really the foundation of so many things. It's not that it has to be the only answer that everyone needs to be a huge soil nerd or geek like I am, but the idea is when we're looking at, you know, the least uh, effort for the greatest benefit, right? That's why I'm so excited about, about soils because changing our agriculture systems has to happen. We can do everything else if we did everything else right and kept our destructive agriculture system, our species is done for still. But if we fix that, you know, and almost did nothing else, you would actually have a, a, a real future. Um, not that we should do nothing else, but it all comes back to access to food and access to water and all of these other social things that we get caught up in. Well, they're going to go real quickly down your priority list if we don't have access to food and water, right? And we take these things for granted. So the soil we've taken for granted, the microbes, the microbes that are in those soils we've taken for granted because we don't get to see them. And so that's what we hope that a film like The Need to Grow can do is to just build that awareness a little bit of these things that are so small that the naked eye can't see, but they are. that doesn't mean that they're not there and that doesn't mean that they're not important. And so, uh, you know, dive into the science of soils and start composting and see if you can grow some of your own food and just be part of that solution. And hopefully we can all do it together. Indeed. Excellent. Alan, back to you. All right. Well, thank you again, Rob, for being on the Local Paleo Show. And as we say in Texas, à votre santé, y'all. Adios. No, I didn't know. I didn't know what the, that translated to. So I assumed it was an au revoir. It's, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a inside joke. Uh, I've also said something in French. <laughs>